morning, everyone. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving this week. I know you're going to be with a, a lot of family. Our priorities here are God, family, and others. And so you're prioritizing God in your life today by being here. Well done. Uh, this week, you're going to be prioritizing family and others, and that's very good for us. These three pieces are important to our ministry. We think they're essential to your spiritual journey. So this week, behave yourself, all right? When you go into those family meetings, don't get into a lot of arguments. Uh, try to be a blessing. I think it will be a big blessing to you. Today, I get to wrap up a short series we're doing. My name is Ron Otto, by the way. Uh, a lot of guests with us again. Man, we love this, this flow of guests that are coming and checking us out. And if you decide to, to land here, uh, we're going to be very concerned about your spiritual growth and about you making friends. And so you're in a very good place, all right? But we're wrapping up a series today on contentment. Contentment is a very powerful thing. If you can learn this, if you can uh, accept this into your life and grow in this area, I'm telling you, it's empowering what could happen. But you got to be careful because discontent is waiting around every corner for us. I was flying a while back, and, and I, it was an early flight, American Airlines, and went out of St. Louis, and I got down there, and I was rushing, and so I didn't have time for any breakfast. I'm sitting on the plane. It takes off. I find myself a little bit hungry, and I'm like, oh, man. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and I saw the joy of the snack cart. American Airlines still does the snack cart. The flight attendant's coming down the aisle. I'm like, all right, here we go. And would you like a soda, sir? Absolutely, I'd like a soda. You know? Would you like a little snack? And she was pushing these little cookie things. And I'm like, do you, do you have peanuts? And she's like, yeah, we have peanuts. And she reached in and with her, it was in a napkin. So when she handed it to me, I, it was the tiniest little package of peanuts you've ever seen in your life. Seven. <laughs> And so I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting there. Now, the dude next to me, he, he gave his drink order, and then he's like, hey, I'd like some peanuts too. She said, sure, and she had. And then that guy had the gall to ask for a second package, and she gave it to him. So now I'm sitting there, and I, I got to tell you, seven peanuts, 14. <laughs> and I found myself struggling with displeased. I was displeased about this. What is going on? By the way, the last of the Ten Commandments is really curious. In Exodus chapter 20, when Moses is getting the Ten Commandments, the very last one says, you shall not, you shall not covet anything that your neighbor has. And then it goes into a list. You shouldn't cover, covet his house. You shouldn't covet his his wife, you shouldn't covet his means of transportation. It says donkey and ox, but his means of, you know, not peanuts, not peanuts. You're not supposed to covet peanuts. And I'm like, okay, God in his wisdom said, okay, I don't want you coveting other people's things. And the antidote to that, the cure to not coveting, believe it or not, is contentment. That when you and I can discover contentment right where we're at, then we don't covet what other people have. It's what one of our elders said very wisely when we were talking about this sermon series. He said, you know, it's learning to wear the shoes God has given you to wear, not desiring someone else's shoes. And we live in this whole world that covets what other people have. We want their fame. We want their fortune. We want their wealth. We, we, we want their life sometimes. And Paul says, I've learned, I've learned to be content no matter what the circumstance, I've learned this. Now, I am not by nature a contented person and neither are you. This is not something that the minute you began your walk with Jesus, he just went blink and you became this content. That's not how it happens. It's something that you have to grow in. I have to grow in contentment. So I've set this goal for my year next year. I'm going to grow in, I'm going to learn what it means to be content next year. I'll let you know if I reach it or not. <laughs> Trust me, you'll hear. And, uh, and, 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 and then I, I need to tell you this too. There's nothing wrong with wanting things, by the way. There's nothing wrong with wanting to uh, reach a higher level at work or, or to uh, finish a degree. or There's nothing wrong with those things. And there's nothing wrong with asking God for things. 
you're free to ask God for some things you would even like to have in this world. But once you've asked him, you find yourself content right now while you're waiting for him to move you to the next point. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you can't find happiness with where you're at right now, uh, I think that sends a level of uh, that you don't trust God. I think there's a level of distrust of him. And so I, I want to discover this contentment. By the way, contentment, the meaning of contentment is beautiful. You are at peace with yourself and with others. There's a level of satisfaction. There's an ease to life, how you approach life. There's more of an ease to it. You're not always aggressive. You're not always stressed. There's an ease to life. There's a fulfillment and a gladness. Is there anything on that list you don't want? <laughs> of course we want all of that. So then when God's talking about contentment in 1 Timothy chapter 6, this is how God's word says it. Godliness with contentment is great gain. The first week we did this series, I pointed out that I see an equation here that I cannot get my mind off of. Godliness plus contentment equals great gain. Don't get that reversed. There's a whole world out there, a whole culture who's told themselves that once I have great gain, then I'll be content and then I'll, I'll add the godliness later. And that totally reverses what God said would be great gain for you and I. Do you think God is right in what he said? Do you, do you think God knows what he's talking about when he says this? I'll bet he does. And I'll bet when he put that down in scripture that he knew exactly what would be good for me. So I'm gonna prioritize God in my life. And then I'm gonna to learn to be content right where I'm at. And while I'm waiting for the next, next step. By the way, oh, one more thing. Uh, you'll never be fully content in the world we live in, by the way. Because uh, this world is not our home. If, if you're not a Christian, you don't, you're not really grasping what I'm saying here. But for those who are Christians in the room, they know. We, we have set our hopes and our, our desires on heaven, on eternal life with Jesus Christ. We, we know we're going there. This is, this is not our country. We're dreaming of another country that's off in the distance. And so until we're home, we're never going to be fully content with the world around us. You're not fully content because we're looking for that. At the same time, though, God says, but boy, contentment would be great gain if you could just discover it right now. And so while I'm waiting here for what God is taking me to, I can find happiness and contentment right here. And boy, if you could find that today, it would change everything for you. Some of you in this room know right now that you're, you're in this grip of discontent for all kinds of reasons. And it's not serving you well. How would you like to break loose from that? What will it empower you to do? I, I got three things that just came to mind. I hope they're from the Spirit, and I believe that there's someone in the room here today. You need to hear what I'm about to say. If you discover this godly contentment that we're talking about, it will help you to do three things. Number one, it will help you to love big, by the way. Just love big. The more contentment I have, the more... Uh, tender I am, the more loving I can be around us. Paul says faith, hope, and love. These three are very important. Faith, hope, love, very important to your well-being. But by the way, the greatest of these is love. The greatest is, of these is love. Almost all of God's word, he uses the word love over and over and over again. It dictates what he does and why he's doing it. He hands it to you and I and he says, here, this is why you're doing what you're doing. It's because you love. Love God, love family, love others, priorities. <laughs> but some of us are struggling in this, this love commandment. <laughs> the tin man of the Wizard of Oz, he had been frozen in time. He was rusted, by the way, when Dorothy and Scarecrow found him. They grab the oil can, they oil him up, they get him moving again, and then all of a sudden Dorothy says, look at that, you're perfect. <laughs> and he goes, perfect, perfect. He goes, I'm not perfect. He goes, just, just knock on my chest. And she knocks on his chest and, oh, it's hollow. And he goes, yeah, the tinsmith forgot to give me a heart. And then he cuts into song. 
brace yourselves. When a man's an empty kettle, he should be on his mettle, and yet I'm torn apart. Just because I'm presuming that I would be kind of human if I only had a heart. Oh, it's deserved. <laughs> you know any tin men around you? Anybody who's struggling to love big? There's marriages. You're struggling right now, and you're not content. You're just not happy. You're not content, and it's affecting your relationships, and it's affecting your place at work, and... Man, you could really change things where you work if you just showed up tomorrow morning with this level of contentment. It, it doesn't mean you don't want something better. It doesn't mean you don't want more pay. It doesn't mean you don't want a higher position. That's not what it means, but it just means while you're waiting for those things, you're just going to find this level of contentment. And you're going to love people around you, which, by the way, the, the Bible speaks pretty harshly for someone who doesn't love. Can I show you one of them? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Oh, if I speak of the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. I, if I could do miracles, move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm really nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor, if I die a martyr's death, but I have not love, I've gained Nothing. Did you see all the phrases in there? I gain nothing. I am nothing. I'm an annoying noise in this world. Why? Because I haven't learned to love. And to love big. And I think if I just find this contentment that God talks about, I think it frees me to love the way God wants me to love. And so that's number one. Number two, it helps us to live bold. To love big and to live bold in this world. We live in a Christian, living a Christian life in the culture right now of uh, confusion that we have around us is hard. I tell young people all the time, are you sure you want to be a Christian? Because it's, it's really a bold move in this world. People will hate you for it. People will reject you for it. There's families here today that you know when you go to Thanksgiving Day, you know there's going to be some family members who have reject you because of your Christianity. It happens every year. But we live bold. Why? Because I'm content that what God, God will put me in whatever circumstances he wants me in, and I'm content to be there. And it doesn't even matter if there's some hardships with that. You know, I, I'm going to live this contented life. Peter and John, man, they found themselves arrested because they were telling everyone in Jerusalem that, that Jesus was resurrected. That got him into a lot of trouble. Just their whole Jesus thing got them into so much trouble. They arrested him. They hauled him in. The authorities of the community said, hey, you've gone way too far here with all this teaching. And, and by the way, the entire time, all they can do is point to Jesus, point to Jesus. Even in their uh, defense of all of this, Acts chapter 4. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, <laughs> which has now become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Man, Peter and John, they wouldn't compromise. They wouldn't back down. They had this astonishing boldness. They just lived this, this bold life. Even though the, the authorities, the city authorities said, you got to stop doing that. And they're standing there. And oh, by the way, uh, you city authorities, the dude you killed, he's still alive. He's walking around. <laughs> and they're like, no, you got to stop that. And when I'm just content that whatever happens, happens, it helps me to live bold. By the way, the outcome of that trial is pretty powerful. In Acts chapter 4, this was their conclusion. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were just unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. My my boldness sends a message to my loved ones around me that I've been spending time with Jesus. If I compromise too much, that compromise does not send the message I'm looking for. No, I'm bold to love them, but I'm also bold to tell the truth. Love big, live bold, and finally, number three, move forward. Man, I struggled with this last one, move forward. Um, 
Number three, <laughs> move forward. Uh, so here's why I'm struggling, because I know some of your stories. I'm sorry for the abuses of the past that have been handed down to you. You didn't do anything to deserve that, but some of you have those in your past. And I'm not asking you to be content with your, with your abuses. It's, it's okay to condemn the past, but to also accept that God is moving you forward. It's, it's okay to say what was done then was, was wrong. That was wrong what they did. And it doesn't matter if it was a, a, a light abuse or a heavy abuse. It doesn't matter if a, an employer mistreated you or, or somebody actually committed criminal crimes against you. It, it's okay to look back and, and condemn that and say that was wrong. But I believe God is, is moving me in this direction. He's taking me to the next step. And so I got to discover my contentment right here. I'm going to turn my back on, on all of that and move forward. The apostle Paul, who had all these horrible things happen to him, horrible things. He was, he was arrested and he had done nothing wrong but be a follower of Jesus. He was flogged. He was exposed to death again and again. Five times he received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was pelted with stones. Three times he was shipwrecked. Three times he was shipwrecked. Don't sail with Paul is the message there. But anyway, he spent a night and a day in the open sea. He had all kinds of dangers around him all the time. And when Paul's thinking about the past, do you know what he concludes? He goes, I think I'll just move forward. <laughs> He, all these horrible things happened to me just because I'm a believer. He did no crimes, but I think I'll just move forward. Here's how he says it in Philippians 3. But one thing I do, I forget what is behind, and I start straining toward what is ahead. I press on to this goal to win this great prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I condemn the past. I set my sights on the future moving forward and I find contentment right here while I'm waiting for that to happen. While I'm waiting for heaven, I just find contentment. I move forward. Love big, live bold, move forward. What did you need to hear today? You know, this contentment thing is a huge joy factor for you if you can find it. You start growing in that today, it's going to change everything. It's going, to, it's going to bring a smile to you, and then that's going to cause smiles on others. It's going to make you laugh, and it's going to make others laugh. And I like to laugh. We laugh through a lot of things uh, at our house. I have this new Harley Davidson, uh, Davidson shirt that I was real proud of. I wore it a few times, but then it became time to wash it, and uh, I'm like... I'll, I'll do that myself. And I went downstairs and I found myself at the washing machine with all these buttons. And I'm like, so I yelled up to Bonnie. I'm like, what setting do I use? And she said, <laughs> yelled back, I don't know. What's it say on the shirt? And I yelled back, it says Harley Davidson. <laughs> See, now that, that's funny to me. But upstairs, I could hear her eyes roll and her head wag. You know, it's like, <laughs> There's something about contentment. The person who is just contented in this world that changes everything, not just for them, but for, it starts to affect people around them. It starts to become contagious. I think you and I can do this. Oh, I don't think I'm able to find contentment on my own. I think I got to have God's help to do that. And so today I make a choice. God, you're first, and, and the fact that you're here this morning, you prioritize God. Good job. But now we want to add to that moment contentment. I need you to relax a little bit. Take a deep breath. Ask God what you need to ask him for. Trust him that it's going to happen, but just while you're waiting for him, you're going to discover contentment. And I'll bet, I'll bet God is right that this is exactly what you and I need. Godliness plus contentment equals great gain. And who among us doesn't want to have some great gain today?